Ladies and gentlemen, tonight you are joining me to pay tribute to one of the best pieces of technology ever created. Born in Japan, during the year 2000, I present you the one, the only, the PlayStation 2! Seriously, what can be said about the PlayStation 2? It's my favorite console of all time. I have owned it ever since I was a kid and I would not replace it with any other console, especially because of all the enjoyment its games have given to me. Maybe not all of them are exclusive, but these titles are excellent experiences that will give you hours of fun, so I finally decided to make a countdown based on these masterpieces. But wait, I'm not alone this time. Along this video you will watch segments made by 9 people who auditioned to be part of this. Now, before we begin this huge project, there is a few disclaimers you must listen to. First of all, this is my own personal list, so I would really appreciate if you respect my opinion, and you can always make a comment or a video response with your own top 10. Secondly, I'm not a millionaire, I cannot afford the entire library of games from a console, so please don't complain if there are some games missing, like Devil May Cry, Sly Cooper, Resident Evil 4, and many more. Don't worry, I will try to get my hands on them. Finally, this is one per franchise, in order to avoid repetition. Oh, and maybe you will see minor spoilers in some segments. I cannot control that. So, as everything has been said, let's begin. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Top 10 PlayStation 2 Games! on the dedicated gamer. Hey you! You have the Omni Ranch, the Gravity Bomb, the Blitz Gun, the Gravity Boots, the Grind Boots, the Glider, the Rhino 2. Are you alright? And now on the dedicated gamer. Where? Where am I? Oh right. That kid blew up out of enthusiasm and now I'm stranded in space. Wow. If this happened just because he experienced Rash and Clank 2 going commando, I don't even want to think how, of how he would he react to Rash and Clank 3 up your arsenal. The Rash and Clank series was always action platforming at its best, filled with great games, but 3 was revolutionary and even a good reason enough to buy PS2, if you didn't own one already that is, which you probably already did. This was probably the best game out there for the PS2, in terms of gameplay that is, because it managed to add so much to an already great formula and still being accessible and easy to get into. The gameplay was all about jumping and shooting, but there was so much to it that it wasn't even funny. Please note that the game is actually quite funny, this was just to demonstrate how good the game was. In this game you are given 20 weapons to use as you wish in combat. 10 gadgets that allow you to solve many different puzzles and an omni wrench for those who are feeling melee-ish. Unlike its predecessors, the weapons in this game have 5 different levels and, upon evolving, will be gifted with better stats and maybe even a special effect like electrocuting the enemies. The levels were expanded and are ridiculously big when compared to the other games. Because of the large areas that these levels have, the game also introduced vehicles that's right, tanks and planes for the player to command and blast every single baddie surrounding him. All these neat introductions were also a good excuse to add, you guessed it, online play. Up to 8 players, on the PS2. I'll say this right now, it's better than a certain game. <coughs> the gameplay managed to have a lot of variety, challenge and depth without being too frustrating or messy because it stayed true to the formula that is already quite easy to get into to begin with, just like every game should be. Now on to the plot. 
This is where it gets really funny. I haven't played this game in a long while and my memory was a bit blurry. I remember going Commando's plot just fine, but that's because I played that game for a longer time than up your arsenal. But now that I got a chance to replay this game, I find myself enjoying the plot even more than going Commando, mostly due to the witty writing. In Up Your Arsenal, Ratchet and Clank have to stop an evil robot called Dr. Nefarious from roboticizing every life form in the galaxy. Now, this may seem like the average idealistic plot, but it's incredibly enjoyable due to the work that has been put into the characters. They're all unique in their own way and I can safely say that each one has made me smile at least once. No regrets. Heck, this game even made Quark, the quote unquote villain from the first game, incredibly likable. In the first games he was Gary, Oak, Pigma and that dog all combined, always trying to find a way to screw you up, but this game actually made me like Quark for the role he had in the plot of this game. Sure, he was still incredibly self-centered and a pussy, but I can say that he was redeemed in this game. Also, just like the first games, this one had a lot of pop culture references that were even better than the ones from the first. Nope, you are not dreaming. This is actually a robotic version of Britney Spears called Courtney Gears. Too bad she sided with Nefarious. The writing in this game even has some times when I ask myself, how is this game rated E for everyone? Well, if someone can reference Woody Allen's everything you always wanted to know about sex but were afraid to ask into My Little Pony Friendship is Magic and still get away with it, then I probably shouldn't be surprised that the mature humor of this game got passed under the radar. The soundtrack isn't really a strong point of the game, but it's good nonetheless, and it was a big improvement from the last games. The last games had a solid soundtrack, but it wasn't memorable at all and it was overshadowed by the amazing gameplay, plot and visuals. Firstly, Up Your Arsenal improved with some incredibly catchy tunes, su such as Secret Agent Clank and Courtney Gear's song. Yeah, they're part of the pop culture references, but they still count as the game's soundtrack. And last, but not least, the visuals are fucking awesome for PS2 standards. All the models are incredibly clean, the environment is extremely detailed and the levels have an amazing atmosphere. I can say that the atmosphere for Going Command was better than this one, but the slight graphical enhancement of this game is able of showing the true colors of the PS2 and how it is one of the best consoles of all time. Whew, now that's what I call a nostalgia trip. Hey, I just remembered something. I'm stranded in space just like Nefarious was after the credits of the game. Oh, the irony. In 1996, a company called Night Dog created Crash Bandicoot. I'm sure you all know how that went. In 1999, Night Dog made one more Crash game, Crash Team Racing, and then stopped making Crash games. Then went off to make Jack and Daxter. Jack and Daxter was one of the most anticipated games on the PlayStation 2. Jack and Daxter's story and gameplay is pretty simple. You play as Jack, a silent, brave, and curious 15-year-old boy. One day, Jack accidentally turned his best friend, Daxter, into an ossel. And you have to go through many different theme levels like snow, jungle, and beach levels. And in each level, there are many things to collect. One item that you need to collect are power cells. You must collect enough power cells to help Daxter turn back into a human and somehow save the world. The game sold very well and received positive reviews. However, it wasn't perfect. The story wasn't anything special. The gameplay can get repetitive and it wasn't very innovative. A lot of people compare this game to Banjo-Kazooie and Super Mario 64. However, there are a lot of positives that balance out the negatives. To make up for the story, we get to listen to Daxter's hilarious dialogue. And there are some awesome vehicle stages so the game doesn't feel too repetitive and it feels a little bit more innovative. Bottom line, Jack and Daxter was a good game. It could have been better, but it was a good game. Two years later, Jack 2 came out. 
and it was a huge step up from the first game. The story was dark and a lot more interesting. At the beginning of Jack 2, Jack and Daxter get shot into the future and they arrive at Haven City, the new area and kind of overworld of the games. However, Jack and Daxter got separated and Jack gets captured. While Jack was captured, he was exposed to a lot of dark eco. Two years later, Daxter finds Jack and helps him break out. But Jack was exposed to too much dark eco and now he can turn into Dark Jack, which is a mindless beast version of Jack. Dark Jack is twice as strong as normal Jack, and he's much more fun to play as. And that's all I can really say about the story without spoiling anything. There's also new gameplay mechanics. There's a previously mentioned Dark Jack. You can now use guns as another way of attacking. The gameplay is more similar to Grand Theft Auto this year. You can steal and ride vehicles, and there are various different missions you can do. This game was great, however, there are some major flaws. The biggest flaw would be the checkpoint placement. The checkpoint placement was awful, and it was a real turnoff. In Jack 2, most of the action happened in Haven City, and to get around, you have to use the hover cars. And I'll be okay if the hover cars didn't control like crap. And the bosses weren't spectacular either. Overall, Jack 2 was a great game, but it wasn't perfect. Only Naughty Dog made a third Jack game that combined all the things we loved about the Jack games and eliminated all the flaws. Oh, wait. Naughty Dog finally got it right with Jack 3. Almost everything you can think of was improved with this game. The controls, the story, the bosses, you name it. The story is a little less darker than Jack 2, but it was so much more interesting. At the beginning of Jack 3, Jack and Daxter get captured and they're brought to the desert. Jack and Daxter gets rescued by some local townspeople, and Jack has to prove he is worthy. Once Jack proves he's worthy, the story progresses more, and you find out the real goal of the game is to save the world, and that's all you really need to know about the story without spoiling anything. There are three worlds in this game. There's Haven City, which is smaller and different from the original Haven City in Jack 2. There's Sparta City, which is like Haven City in Jack 2, but it's in the desert. And the biggest area of the game, the Wasteland. In the wasteland, you drive around and do missions. And speaking of driving, you have to use the hover cars as much as you do in Jack 2. Instead of the hover cars, you have a doom buggy, which is a joy to play with. And the gameplay is where it really shines. There are three types of gameplay. Platforming, shooting, and driving slash flying. The difficulty is just right. It's not too easy, and it's not too hard. But at times, it can be really hard. Also, this game has some of my favorite video game characters of all time. My favorite is Daxter. I freaking love this guy. Almost every time he opens his mouth, I have a smile on my face. Isn't it kind of nice just to curl up in the shade sometimes? Just chilling it. Watching the hot babes prance around in their skimpy little bikinis. You know, just how they jiggle. I get that special tingling feeling in my tail. And Count Figure. This guy's one of my favorite villains ever. I know most people hate this guy, but he does do his role as a villain really well. But my Jack 3 is an amazing game, and it's the best Jack game in the series. If you don't have it, or never played it, What's wrong with you? Buy it. If you don't have a PS2, and if you have a PS3, get the HD collection. This place has too much excitement. Notice how this production has not yet mentioned Crash Bandicoot. Well, if you watched this guy's previous work, you would know what's coming next. And I'm assuming you do, so let's go there. Where are you, big brother? 
brother. There's something weird going on in the bay. Come see. Oh, how I do love this countdowning occupation. Oh, so much. Yes, it's Crash Twin Sanity. And honestly, what's not to love? I mean, it's got Crash, great platforming, some of the funniest humor I've seen in a while, a working team mechanic between two longtime enemies, and boss battles that are absolutely amazing. I mean, just amazing. Now you're probably wondering, what makes this so different from any other game? Well, let me list off a few things. First off, a snow level that is actually fun to play. A tutorial level done right. And finally- Hey, hey, hey! Yeah, you! I've been doing this for ten stinking years! Back and forward, back and forward, and I'm sick of it! Well, I'm not gonna do it no more! Now that is how fourth wall humor is done. Besides, when you really think about it, this is your alternative to Crash to Insanity. So yeah, would you rather have Crash to, Crash to Insanity or Mind Over Mutant? I'll let you think. Why, hello that PS2 peeps. <laughs> Hey you! Are you a dull, lifeless nerd? Of course you are. You're watching a video game on a 12 year old console. Ah! And because you're a nerd, you can't stand up for yourself, and you're always being busted by the school bully. Ah! Isn't that right, you little weakling? Yes, it is. But how can the modern day helpless nerd solve these issues? Just eat dog! Bully Canis Canim is arguably Rockstar's most underrated sandbox title. With 1 minute 12 second loading times. Yippee! It combines the Rockstar gameplay you all know and love, and aims and achieves an A+, with adding fresh new experiences revolving a deep insight into school life. Wait, I'm not supposed to do the conclusion yet. Wait, this game has crude language, sexual themes, drugs, booze and violence? I'm sorry Julian, I can't attend this class. Someone else is going to have to do this segment. Blame my parents. Hi there, Ella. The game is set in Bullworth Academy in New England. Wait, there's a new England? Sign me up, let's go! Tell you how! Hi, everybody. And this unique setting for a game is the best state ever! Steely, New England isn't a state, it's a real... And that is basically your reaction in simple terms when you arrive at the most deprived school in the country that is the Dulworth Academy. Huh? Huh? And so your commitment issued failed mother, who is on a sick husband, which is freaking more than Ross Keller, Unagi. decides that it'd be a smart idea just to disown you and ditch you for a year long cruise with your new rich old phony husband. She's a nice woman, and you've got no other choice since you've probably been expelled from every other school in the state anyway. So Jimmy has to fend for himself and be himself, climbing high school social ladder, making friends and enemies along the way. The school boasts a whopping 60 students that rivals the population of Saffron City! Skateboarding, pulling girls, mowing lawns, Jimmy's like your average teenager. When he's not skipping school or free home in New England, Jimmy has to attend classes. Yippee! And they're much more addicting than they are in real life. Our curvy's chemistry is sharp, plus photography, it all started with a big... And I'm sorry Julian, but is it just me, or does the chemistry minigame remind me of that song from Kingdom Hearts 2? I'm sorry Julian. Ha, I have a bullet poster in you don't. So Oddly, home economics and history are never available to Jimmy. So it's time for Stelios' five, five second lessons! Hey! Right, here we are, class home economics. This is how you make food. 
history class. Stellar society is history. Speaking of being a rebel, the reason why I love this game so much is despite Jimmy's goal of standing up to the bullies, it doesn't mean that he can't punch the fat nerd every once in a while, which I have no footage of. that's evil. But if he does this, the school's army of prefects that outnumber the freaking students will get you quicker than Slenderman. I'm serious, they do add some awesome difficulty. Make sure you don't get busted! As well as excelling in the amazing soundtrack that you can hear, Rockstar's amazing character development also follows through, all adding to Jimmy's torrid high school career. Characters are appealing and some of Rockstar's finest, whether it's the admittedly pathetic teachers or the stereotypical pupils. He's got the wimpy Petey, everyone's favourite Super Mario sympathetic sunshine boss. Breaking Gary, who Rockstar make me love to hate, he is literally everyone's favourite student who wants to rule the school and use you, which is why it's so satisfying beating Mr. Final Part oh! spoilers. Why do all Garys in video games have to be such dick? God, I am the, the night, the school, the prefects, the enemies, the girls, the Garys. It's Jimmy Hopkins versus the world with unique sandbox gameplay that isn't just guns for a change. There's fire extinguishers too, married with the exciting plot twists, hilariously unique missions and characters from hobo fighting to art teacher romancing makes it the best. Wow, it's got roller coaster, fucking roller coaster. Yeah. Whether you're hitting hammers or on girls, hiding in bins, lockers or girls' toilets, beating up nerds, bullies can is kind of made school life addictively eventful with a deep hidden message that Julian has an awesome taste in PS2 games. Um, Which is why I was good enough to be enchanted on the 360 on the Wii. Yes, there was a Rockstar game on the Wii. Now make a bully too, Rockstar, or I'll bully you! This'll be you! Grand Theft Auto. Oh, what a wonderful series this is. I was once a boy like any other. I had hopes and dreams. I loved Pokemon and Legos. Then one day I played a game called Grand Theft Auto San Andreas and my whole life changed. I learned important lessons that helped me get through hard times. I modeled my life around the characters and situations I encountered. I learned that it wasn't so important where you came from. You can do great things no matter what. What I found in myself while playing this game is the reason I am where I am today. I owe all my life's successes to my experiences I had while playing San Andreas. If it wasn't for them, I'd just be some loser kid sitting at his computer writing a fake story for an entry in someone else's countdown. Thank you, Grand Theft Auto, for all you have given me. Okay, maybe GTA San Andreas isn't that sentimental for me. I only picked it up a little over a year ago, but it is still a great game. The story follows Carl Johnson, or CJ as most people refer to him. CJ returns back to his home in Los Santos after five years of living in Liberty City when he learns of his mother's murder. As CJ, you reunite with many of his old friends, joining back in with the Grove Street Gang. Without spoiling too much, the story is very strong, one of the better stories in the GTA series. The game takes place in the state, that's right, the STATE of San Andreas. While most open world games stick you in a city, in this game, you have an entire state to roam around in. San Andreas is based off areas in California and Nevada. There are four main cities in the game. Los Santos, which is based off of Los Angeles, San Fierro, which is based off of San Francisco, and Las Venturas, which is based off of Las Vegas. The large, expansive world means there is a lot to discover, so whether you are following the story missions or just driving around, there will be plenty to see. Gameplay-wise, San Andreas features an interesting, almost RPG-like progression mechanic. Not only can you customize CJ with different clothes, hairstyles, tattoos, etc., you can also raise and lower stats. Some of these stats directly affect CJ's appearance. It can be a lot of fun tiptoeing the line between The Rock and Fat Albert. All in all, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas stands as one of the finest open world experiences ever made, with great characters and a fantastic environment.
Welcome to San Andreas, I'm CJ from Grove Street Land of the heinous gangbangers in cold heat And Los Santos neighbors get no sleep Even with... <laughs>